This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We are on part three of developing kingdom muscle for the days ahead. And been doing a lot of this heart searching, even as we're doing this. God's dealing with me with a lot of things. And, you know, I was, I was raised Baptist, surrendered at a Baptist altar at 13, got spirit-filled around 16, uh, was a part of the early charismatic movement back in the 1970s and 80s that uh, still had a lot of the Baptist influence, so there was really some balance. And I think there are a lot of those founders and those that were leaders back then would be rolling over in their graves if they would see a lot of things that's going on in the church today, especially in the charismatic movement. Uh, in fact, I think the charismatic movement have, has conditioned us for the spectacular. And uh, by, by doing that, I think it, it abdicates any responsibility of, any, of the individual uh, guys what I'm, what I'm seeing, even like with the, the Shiner Directive, as long as it's end time prophecy and you don't get up in their business, you know, <laughs> personally with Christians, they have a hunger for everything unless there's personal application. I want to know what's coming. I want to know what's tomorrow. I want to know this. I want to know that. I want to hear stories of people going up and seeing angels and seeing spiritual warfare. I want explosions. I want this. I want that. And we miss sometimes a lot of the things that God does. He does in that still small voice in our life. Those minor adjustments become major things. And uh, I also believe that in so many ways, the, what is being done with the modern church has paved an eight-lane highway for the Gnostics to once again ac gain access to the church, which the early church fought so hard against. That's one of the reasons Peter, because he, he had Gnostics having all these visions, second heaven, third heaven, teleported back, and, and you know, God transported them to the crucifixion so they could give additional information that the eyewitnesses couldn't see that were actually the apostles. And Peter says, listen, I was at the transfiguration. Top that, Jack. But there's a more sure word of prophecy. The written word of God. And he was calling them back to balance. The apostle of love, the apostle John, in his old age, walking a great distance uh, to get to a, a small town that had only one well like many of them would have back then, they said that his knees looked like camel's knees because he had spent so much time on his knees in prayer. This apostle of love, when he walked up and there was a leading Gnostic drinking from that well, he refused to drink from it because he was fearful that because he was at the same well, people would identify him with that Gnostic. And they say that when he saw that, he shook himself, knocked the dust off his feet and kept on walking. And yet now, because of our, our hunger, we have confused Hollywood with the church. And we, we want something like out of the Avengers Assemble or something going on in so many ways. 
Um, guys, what, what I have found personally, and there are, there are those big events, and I'm glad, I'm glad for them. I mean, Mary and I can both see that there were major events that God did, either gave deliverance or saved our lives, or there was a major attitudinal adjustment going on. But many times the true spiritual warfare is the day in and day out what we choose to do. Now, we've been dealing with 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 12 through 24. And I think the casual Christian not understanding, saying, okay, I want God to sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. He reveals the tripartite nature of man. And before this, he gives this litany of these things that we could wax over and let me tell you something, there will be times in your life that those instructions of the Apostle Paul are hard. Rejoice always. In everything, give thanks. Don't get in arguments with brethren. Don't nitpick down. It's like all these things. And what we don't realize is those serve as resistance training to strengthen your spirit, to purify your soul and to bring your flesh and to corral your flesh, begin moving in the kingdom. And sometimes we want to go in this litany of this big, long instruction. Let me tell you something. There are times the Apostle Paul can give you an instruction in four words in a sentence, and it's going to require you to get a hammer and a nail and to crucify something and maybe wrestle it all the way to the altar before you can crucify it. Now I want to start back here in, in uh, verse 11. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. That one right there just hit a lot of church splits right between the eyes, didn't it? And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, engage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another evil with evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. <laughs> I'm looking at it at the NASB, and I've memorized it so much in the King James. I read it in the King James anyway. <laughs> Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterings. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now when you get he says, now, when you start doing those things, now may the God of peace sanctify you, set you apart from, for God and not for the devil. Okay? It's dealing with the same thing that the Apostle Paul in Romans says, don't lend your members for unrighteousness, but lend them for righteousness. Okay? And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Now, I want to touch on, the, the, on uh, verse 19 that we did last week. Do not quench the spirit. And we talked about, and, and uh, I want to say R.C. Sproul, but that's not the right minister. Uh, he was a, a Christian theologian that got a chance to live in Israel for a while. And as providence would have it, uh, a set of doves made their nest in the eaves of his house. And God used it as a training ground. Whenever him and his wife got in a heated argument, the doves were gone. Anytime he'd get mad about something, anytime he'd get in the flesh, man, they were gone. But what he enjoyed the most is in his prayer time, just hearing them up there kind of cooing like doves do, was just, was just really something neat and, and really a blessing to him. And the Holy Spirit says, what am I represented as in the New Testament? As a dove. And he said, now Jesus, I remained on him, not only because he was Messiah, because, but he never did anything that grieved me, as our example. And so he began to be conscious of the discussions he and his wife had and what was going on in the home, just seeing how long, does it, what, what, how long is it going to be before they, they, they flee the coop, you know? 
And I think we need to have that sensibility or that sensitivity with the Holy Spirit. There, in, in Mary and in my testimony, there have been times, I remember the one time we were going uh, to visit somebody in the church and we were on the highway and uh, God literally took our peace and Mary says, that's it, we got to turn around, this something's bad wrong. Turn around and before we even get going on the highway, the state patrol are pulling us over and there was another car headed us at over 100 miles an hour, going to clip the back of us. So there were, there were people, and by, by us turning around, it put them into panic mode that they weren't going to be able to get it done. And then there were all kinds of other crazy stuff going on on the highway. But how many times if believers, if we feel the Holy Spirit beginning to draw back, should we not also draw back? And listen, I'm as guilty as everybody else getting focused on the thing, not paying attention, and I mean the list can be long. And if we will work on developing a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. How many situations is he going to be able to keep us safe and more? You see, the best thing is not having an angel show up to cut off somebody's head. The best thing is not to have a supernatural event. And many times, you know, if we're honest with each other, Many times some of those supernatural events are to overcome your stupidity in the moment because you weren't following the Spirit of God but following your own flesh or your own agenda or whatever it is. I even remember years ago when uh, in the charismatic movement I got uh, exposed to the faith movement. And some of the things at the beginning of the faith movement I think were very good as well as the integrity of keeping your word. And finally, one of the, the ministers came out, and this was probably back in the late 80s, and he says, we're having to readjust this. And he said, I'm, I'm not saying readjust your integrity, but he says, if you're feeling the Holy Spirit taking away your peace about going to a conference, maybe instead of, instead of bearing through and by faith, I'm going to attend this conference, I'm not going to let the devil. He said, maybe you ought to call and say, listen, God's taking away my peace, what's going on? I can't go if God doesn't change something. And he said, he goes, how many times, he says, have I been on the road or something that Almighty God had to move supernaturally to spare my life? He said that I wouldn't have had if I would have listened to the Holy Spirit and stayed home. John Alexander Dowley talks about a time that he said, and, and he really, in his early years before he Christians got him off, uh, very sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and there was, he was going up kind of like a mountainous area, and there was a curve that kind of goes like this, and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to pull over on that side of the road. There was like a little, you know, place to pull over, because I want you to park there. And okay, I don't know why he does that. He's not there more than two or three minutes, and a truck that lost control that was on both sides of the highway came around that corner, and if he hadn't have done that, that truck would have hit him head on. See, there's something about, so in my day-to-day -day life, as I'm, as I'm laboring not to quench the Spirit of God, prepares us for moments like that, that the Holy Spirit can get our attention and grab our ear and say, you better come over here and do this, you better, you better not go there. And I tell you what, not needing a supernatural miracle because of our stubbornness is a whole lot better than hoping an angel shows up. Okay? The next one, and I think this is very timely, verse 20. Do not despise prophetic utterances. We, we had, now, there's, there's a lot going on in the prophetic movement right now. I think a lot of them have never been taught about the double stream. Uh, that I had, I think I deal with in both of my first two books, that in areas where we have not been sanctified can influence us, and Lucifer and his kingdom is able to ride right on top of the anointing of God. He was the anointed cherub that covers. His position was, because the, the, one of the things the, the sages of Israel teach is basically the throne of God is made up of angels. And he was the canopy. He was the anointed cherub that covers. He has an anointing to cover the manifested presence of God. And so what Lucifer loves to do is if he can't get you 
not preaching truth, he can get something in your flesh to skew it. And we've dealt with a lot of things and, and have heard from ministers, and, and there's even people from the occult that have come out, especially those high up in, in the Illuminati type of things. They'll send a person into the congregation to psychically project something into the minister's mind while he's reaching and hearing from God on all this. And if he ever grabs hold of one, they'll tacitly begin basically mentoring and changing his theology. And there's been reports of some eventually coming to him and said, listen, we're Illuminati, we want to recruit you. See, those things are possible. And so we, we have some of that in the prophetic movement going on. And I think we actually have kind of setting it back in context of the early church. They had Gnostics coming in saying they were prophets. And the rule of thumb with the Gnostic, you need to understand the, the era. How many know there wasn't TV? Hold on, there wasn't internet. There wasn't YouTube. There was nothing. And so people clamored for entertainment. And these Gnostics would come into town, the bigger the story, the more entertaining. The showing up of angels, the slaying of dragons in the second heaven, these super weird revelations. The more entertaining and the more that they could capture the audience, the bigger the take was that they lived off of. That's what the apostles were fighting. And they have returned. There are things going on right now. We, we have prophets and prophetesses walking around with wizard staffs and this Christian tarot cards. All these crazy things are going on. People are so enamored for the supernatural and the spectacular that they have opened themselves up to him. We, we have that part of it. And so I think part of that has caused an overreaction in the church against the prophets. Let me tell you something. A prophet needs an apostle as they're maturing to keep them reined in and corrected and to school them because historically a prophet or a navi in our, in our Hebraic tradition in Israel gave the deepest teachings from the Word. I'm not talking about esoteric, but as they read the Torah, they could see the heart of God, and so they would go deeper many times than a Levite would, because they, they saw it from God's perspective. And we've lost that tradition. We have people right now that are prophets that couldn't teach their way out of a wet paper sack, and that totally sets aside part of the duties of a prophet. We, we've got to return back to balance and they're going to have to be mentored. In fact, when a prophet speaks, or anyone even gives this a, a word of prophecy, which is different than a prophet, because the general gift of prophecy is for exhortation, edification, and comfort. It's like a big, warm fuzzy from God. It's okay. I got your back, saith the Lord. I know that, that thou hast the bad week, but I was with you. You know, I prefer those instead of, these are times are scary, saith the Lord. These times are hard, saith the Lord. These times even scare me, saith the Lord. Now, when you have a prophecy like that, you've got to kind of draw back. But there's supposed to be prophets in the church that judge. This is in line with what God is saying, or you prophesied out of your own spirit. And so we need to have balance that way. The other side of the pro of prophetic utterances that we rarely see in the church today is when God starts reading your mail. In times of great revival, Azusa Street, and many other revivals, the first time God got your attention, the second time you went, he convicted the absolute snot out of you. The third time, if you resisted, prophets would begin calling out your sins. One in particular note I thought was, was so phenomenal in the Azusa Street is you had a young black man that barely had maybe an eighth grade education. And the governor of California started coming to the meetings. And one of the things that was kind of a pet project of his is he was very proud that he was fluent in proper Latin. Not something you run across very often. 
And so a guy gets up and gives tongues. Then that young black man stands up. And to everybody else, uh, nobody knows, well, this is kind of an interesting prophecy. It brought the governor to his knees because the first guy that got up that gave tongues spoke in perfect Latin. That young man stood up and gave a perfect high English interpretation of the high Latin. And you could hear the knees knocking of the governor, and he went down and got right with God. You see, there's, there, are, there are things that can come. So on one side, we can despise, oh, no, not another prophet. Oh, not another one with some word. At the same time, it's, oh, no, they're coming. They're, they're, you know, kind of like when, when Jeremiah would come in. Oh, Jeremiah, is there a good word you can give us today? Yeah, you're all going down. <laughs> Oh, uh, I remember one prophet, and in fact, I was trying to remember his name, that looked like a big teddy bear. The, his ministry was real big in the 80s and 90s, and he would talk about judgment on America. He'd say, yeah, it's all going to be destroyed. Glory to God. Bless his holy name. <laughs> and you know, it's like the things he was sharing was so heavy, he'd just have to stop and bless God anyway. He's going to get us through it, you know. And so you, you can have that tendency. But I think if we labor together to bring maturity and not despise when either a prophet is just learning or when we're tired of correction, <laughs> to not despise prophecy. But he goes on to say, verse 21, but examine everything carefully. How many of us do that? When somebody has a prophetic word or something, do we go back to the word and see if it lines up not only with the plain written word of God, but the character of God that's revealed in the word? If we don't, we're in danger. In fact, in another place, the Apostle Paul said, prove everything. And I always think of the proving grounds in the military where you take a weapon and you put it through every possible test. And you stretch it beyond its limits to see where it actually fails. Say, why is that important? Because God says, I'm going to prove you. Okay, Mike, you think you got something? Let me go ahead and I'm going to, I got your back, but I'm going to put you in a situation just to see how long you'll shoot and not get all jammed up. Okay. There are times that God does that, even to the bringing in of false prophets. The Bible talks about that. He says, you know, I, he said, there's a, there's a, there's, if a guy comes and everything he says comes to pass, I don't care if he's an interpreter of dreams, just giving prophetic words, and everything comes to pass. But he says, let's abandon the ways of God and start doing this. He said, I led him in there to test you to see if you love the spectacular more than you did me. I tell you what, that's a word of correction right now for the church. We need to examine everything. There have been times I have gotten so excited about somebody's preaching. And I mean, but at the same time, it wasn't revving up my spirit. It was revving up my flesh. It was revving up my soul. Almost more like being at an Amway convention than it was being in a... And you stop and you look at that and you know, that really preaches good and then you start thinking about it. It's a shame it's really not biblical, but man, it really preaches good. Gets people excited, gets the offering up real big, you know, and, and gets people motivated. Boy, we can build a church on something like this. You can't build a church on lies or half-truths. That's why the job of every single believer is to test everything. Examine it. Be that faithful Berean. I remember years ago when a, uh, he was a guy named Malcolm Smith, and he was very big into uh, proper biblical interpretation. He was big in the charismatic movement a long time ago. And this one church asked him to come and says, we want you to do a seminar, but we want you to do it on proper biblical interpretation. And he says, are you sure? He says, because once I do, as far as the charismatic movement is concerned, I have, will have just ruined your church. Because you will be hell on every guest speaker you ever bring in from this weekend forward. And you will keep your pastor on. Pastor, you really want me to teach them proper hermeneutics? Yes. 
said, okay, you guys asked for it. And for the next, that weekend, he taught them. And then come to find out, they were absolute hell on any traveling minister because he would get whatever he would get on TVN or whatever. And he'd preach it and the whole congregation would be shaking their heads, no. <laughs> but that's really the way it should be. We should be mature enough. How else are we going to correct those that are down and, and all? Because all these things we've already s discovered in this wasn't the job of the pastor. It was the job of all those that were mature in the body. You know, somebody's down, you help them. Somebody's getting an error, you bring correction lovingly. You, you do all these things. You've got to know the word yourself, okay? Not only do we need to examine everything, but only hold fast to that which is good, that which lines up with Scripture. Hard to do sometimes, especially when everybody's doing it. And let me tell you, I want to add this in. There are pastors that may look at me and look like I'm the weirdest thing on planet Earth because I believe in our Hebraic heritage and I'm on the fringe on Bible prophecy and stuff. And they, they have fought to keep whether, you know, it's Baptist, whether it's the, the old time like Assemblies of God, and they're fighting in their congregations to maintain sound doctrine when they have many times the prophets of Baal on Christian television preaching another gospel, preaching another way. And they're holding fast when everybody in their congregation is saying, why can't we have it like this? How come you don't preach that? How come you don't preach this? How come we don't have fog machines? How come we don't have starlights? Why don't we have a Starbucks in the back of the church? Why can't you be this? Why do? And they're pointing back to Jesus, and they're pointing back to the Word. We need to honor those men. Now, there may be some things that God may need to show them to add to the revelation, but they have labored many times at a high cost to be faithful. They need to honor. And I tell you, one of the things I'm getting in my spirit, there's a promotion day coming for those that refuse to compromise. Okay? Next one. How much can I get away with? Abstain from every form of evil. Now, just to make sure, I looked up the original Greek for every. It means every. <laughs> If God says it's wrong, it'll always be wrong. If God says it'll be right, it'll always be right. And the cross never changed a bit of that. It just freed us up so that we could choose the right and reject the wrong. And each time we do that, it is building resistance to the enemy. And one of the things I have found, guys, God is not going to walk you into his spiritual gym and say, there's 500 pounds, bench press it. He'll say, why don't you go curl that two-pound weight over there? He starts you little, and the more resistance that you build, and why is he doing that? Because he loves you, and he knows what the enemy has planned for you in the future. And he's saying, if you don't start resisting this now, you're not going to have the strength to resist what is coming. And so we need to go ahead and just yield to what God wants to do. The next thing I want to deal with is transforming our will. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 16. I feel like some of this is foundational, but I, think, I, I, I just feel like so much of the church has lost its foundation. We, we've lost our moorings. We've, we've, there's, there's just something going on. Because when the fivefold ministry, according to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, does its job, we'll quit being children that are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Right now, much of the church is, is blowing like a leaf on a tree. Which way is the wind blowing? This is the way that we're going to go. What's exciting? What's exciting? So let me tell you something. Crucifixion of the flesh is not exciting, but necessary. Now, at first he commends them, and then he slaps the modern church right upside the head. Okay. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He used a four-letter word 
in that verse. Oh, brother, the Apostle Paul was preaching salvation by works. Oh, grace, 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 grace. You know what that means? Ain't got to do a thing. Ain't got to do a thing. Don't have to do nothing. Just sit here until I get to heaven. And you're going to end up with adult size depends on when you get there because you never got out of the nursery. Okay? In fact, years ago, one of the things, one of the few, there's, there's, I've had very few visions in my life, and the ones I have have been life changing. One of them was, I remember I was in Germany. And I was really kind of griping at God, although I was so stuck on stupid and immaturity. And it was like one of those things you're praying for yourself and you don't know it too, about the immaturity of the body. And uh, I kept on saying, God, I want, you to, I want you to show me how you feel. And God literally brought, brought me to my knees for 20 minutes. I cried like a baby. But at the same time, he showed me. It's like the, the, the gate that we enter into, the narrow gate. There is one room that just keeps on having to be built onto and be built onto and be built onto. It's the nursery. And he said, we're so excited about the very few that, that find their way in the gate. But he said, how many find their way out of the nursery? And uh, that, that got me. Every once in a while, God reminds me of that. I'm thinking, okay, Lord. And it, did I go from pampers to toddlers and now depends? Or am I actually able personally to, to function outside of that. But we, we, we have got to, there, there is work involved for spiritual maturity. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to, to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Well, that really got hard right there, didn't it? So that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Boy, if that was never true, it's true today. Among whom you appear as lights in the world. Hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in labor. Now when I looked up this Greek word, work out. Because it's not work separate, it's work out as one word. And for those that want to look it up, it's Strong's number Greek 2716, if you don't believe me. To perform, to accomplish, to work out, i.e., to do that which, uh, from which something results. Now, I wanted to make sure I was reading this right. This is out of the commentary critical and, and, exp and explanatory uh, of the whole Bible. Work out to its, carry out to its full perfection or maturity. Salvation is worked in believers by the Spirit who enable them through faith to be justified once and for all. But it needs, as a progressive work, to be worked out by obedience through the help of the same Spirit unto perfection, which is an old Wesleyan term for maturity. The sound Christian, neither like a formalist, rests in the means without looking to the end and to the Spirit who alone can make the means effectual, nor like the, the fanatic who, uh, who uh, hopes to attain the end without the means. And I think much of the church today would tend on the fanatic side. Uh, well, let me, let me read one more thing from Dake. I thought this was poignant. It said, working in need to both do and to will is good pleasure. If one will not obey in working out his own salvation, will God continue to work with man refusing to permit him? Man's power is to will and to do as he pleases should not be puzzling. Such power comes from God, but the use of it lies within man. One who will not use the power to work out his salvation will be held responsible all people possess the power, but not all use it. Okay? What's going on in our theology today? Predestination prior to Calvin was a side note. 
in Christian theology historically. Calvin did not come up with a revelation in his study about predestination. What precipitated it was a severe error of the Catholic Church trying to subvert the Protestant movement. Because what the Pope would do looking at a country like, like Luther was able to hide in Germany because the king was mad that they didn't make him Pope, and God set the way to make a safe haven for Luther. And so that king says, I like Protestantism instead. Well, what the Pope would do is, I'm excommunicating every Catholic in the nation of Germany. You're all going to hell. Your children are now all going to hell. No, yesterday you were good, but now you're going to hell because I've kicked you out of the church. And the only way you can get back in is you have to overthrow your king and install a Catholic-friendly king in his place. Otherwise, your whole nation is going to hell. So to overcome that, Luther had to come up with a doctrine. And Dr. Ken Johnson, in his book on the Gnostic origins of Calvinism, he actually reached into the Nag Hammadi and the apologists from the mystery religions that believed that there were a selected few that had these emanations coming down from Sophia. And in fact, Dr. Michael Heiser has a really neat video on understanding the Nag Hammadi and that type of Gnosticism. And, the, and within their pantheon of gods, the highest one was Sophia. Sound familiar hearing that wisdom, Sophia? And, and, and so they, the Nag Hammadi in Egypt, they kind of blended Christianity and added it all in with it, some of the things the early apostles were fighting. And they said the very last God to come on the scenes was this God named Yahweh. And he was so dumb that he didn't know there were all these other gods that preceded him. That's the Nag Hammadi. But they, they had this thing that there were the chosen that had these emanations coming down from Sophia that elected them. And no matter what they could do, they were always going to be in her good favors and be really good to go in the next life to come. Luther pulled from that and then hyper-focused on predestination, ignoring the fact that predestination came because of foreknowledge. God knew everything that you were going to do. Not only that, God knew that no matter what he did, there would there there be those that would never get saved no matter what he did. And so he confirmed it. I, that's okay. Foreknowledge always comes before predestination because God fills all time and space. Do you know that before God took Adam and began to mold him out of the mud of the earth, he knew you. He knew everything you were going to do. He knew just how honorary you can be and chose to set salvation in motion anyway. And because he saw that if I send my son, he gives his life. And one day he, hear, he or she hears the gospel, and they're going to accept, I put my seal of approval. But at the same God, God puts his seal of approval on those who will never serve him. And he says, that's your right as having free will, that no matter what I did, because he sees every, possible, every possibility known. God's playing 12-dimensional chess while the devil's playing checkers. He knows every possible thing that he could do to lead you to him while still allowing you to have free will and not being an automaton. But see, Calvin went overboard, and Calvin, Calvinists will go overboard. They will tell you that unless you're one of the elect, you can't be saved no matter how much you cry and try to get right with God at an altar. My Bible says anyone who repents and calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved. The knee-jerk reaction to draw from an error to overcome an error created error. And so then you had, now you have the knee-jerk response of much of Protestantism to Calvinism. It was a guy named Arminius. We get the term Arminianism from. Now, hyper-Arminianism basically says if you sin today, you have to get saved again tomorrow. So you get saved again and again and again and again and again. That's not what the Bible deals with. A backslidden believer is the most miserable creature on planet earth. Backsliding is different than saying Jesus was not the son of God. He had the spirit of Beelzebub 
and he deserved the crucifixion. You see, that's what was happening in the synagogue in the book of Hebrews that says, if you deny him, there's no sacrifice left. It's the unpardonable sin Jesus talked about. Because if he was the anointed one and the Holy Spirit rested on him proving his messiahship and you denied that what he did was by the Holy Spirit, it made it impossible for you to say he was the Messiah. You can lose your salvation that way. And for those rare ones, rare, Arminius was saying, listen, they can, grace is both irresistible, is not irresistible, and it's not irrevocable. And so you have this conflict going on. Now what's interesting, in America, most Baptists were Armenianists at the time. Over in Europe, they were all Calvinists, like Spurgeon and Ironside and so many others. Well, God took D.L. Moody over there, had a great revival. He began budding it up with, uh, with Spurgeon, and they began comparing theologies. And so what Moody did is, I like this grace is irresistible, or I like that, that uh, I, I, I like this, you know, that this grace uh, is free will, but I like once you get in, you can't get out. So I like it's irrevocable. And so he took the two extremes of both, blended them together, and brought them back to the American church and began preaching the security of the believer. Nobody can pluck you out of the hand of Jesus, but if you deny Christ, you just walked out of the hand of God. Because the only way in the kingdom is Him. Okay? But today we have hyper-grace error that they're even saying there's no more such thing as sin. The cross changed sin instead of freeing us from the power of sin. And it has caused something else. The nursery, anytime you bring up an issue like the commandments or anything else, which are about maturity, okay, they try to turn it into a salvic issue and say, grace, 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 grace. Well, just stay in the nursery. And when you get to heaven, you're going to find out that your life meant nothing for the kingdom. The Apostle Paul said, when you get up there, you're going to be judged. Some are going to get in, and their entire lives are consumed by the fire of God, and there's nothing. You see, what the feasts teach us is you never appear before the Lord empty-handed. Now, you can't take your checkbook. You can't take your gold. PayPal, believe it or not, is not even recognized in heaven. Okay? All you can take with you is the maturity that, you've, that you have worked with the Holy Spirit. You have worked out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the only thing you can take with you. And the things that he was able to accomplish before you. That is where your crowns come from that we see in the book of Revelation. Because the only thing, what, what are crowns made of? Gold, silver, and precious jewels. It's formed into a crown also that you have the right and the privilege of taking it off your head and casting it at his feet and saying, only because of you, Jesus. We need to separate. And, and there is a commandment for, to get saved. You have to follow one command of God to get saved. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe on Hare Krishna, you ain't getting in there. You have to believe that is a commandment. It's not a suggestion. Because with every commandment, there is an empowerment to do something. That particular commandment is the power to get saved. Okay? And so he's saying, listen, you have got to roll up your sleeves because even though you're saved, it's confined in your spirit, man. It's confined in the Holy of Holies. And you've got to work to allow it to permeate into your soul and to begin affecting what your body does. But what, what is the precipitating thing that enables you to work? With fear and trembling. With fear. The fear of the Lord will get you to where you want more than just getting into heaven. I want my life to count for my king. 
I want to walk in the kingdom. In fact, one of the things that we see with Israel when they went into the promised land while they were in captivity, Egypt, a type and symbol of being the lost, is while you were gone, your soul and your body got filled by the influence of all the ites. The Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Amalekites, and all the other Nephilim spirits and their false doctrines and everything else. There are doctrines of demons. And Hebraically, a doctrine is how you live, not necessarily what you put on your statement of faith. It's what you do, your, your basic philosophy, your basic operating system. When I begin to roll up my sleeves and say, Holy Spirit, do a job on me. I want, to, I want this worked out in every area of my life. It opens the door for the next verse. For it is God who will cause you to will. My will starts lining up with his will. Isn't that what Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This big old hunk of earth right here. I need an attitude adjustment. I need a paradigm shift. I need, I need for my will to line up with yours. Because you have the finite coming up against the infinite. You have the very movable coming up against the very hard immovable object. So guess what? This one needs to change. It's like the old story out at sea. You had an admiral and, a, uh, and communications had gone down and all they had was, you know, they, they, they flashed their lights, kind of Morse code type of thing. And he sees a ship way out there and he says, you need to move. I'm Admiral so-and-so. This guy writes back, I'm a peon, but you need to move. You don't understand I'm the commander of the fifth fleet, and I'm this, that, and the other, and I have this entire arsenal, and I'm, I have an aircraft carrier. And he gets the response back, I'm the lighthouse. You move. The lighthouse is the will of God. And how many times in our life do we end up on the rocks because our will we would not allow to be conformed to his will. Man, sometimes that's a hard thing to do. It is. At the same time, it's that we, we got to drive out these ites. We need to have our wills transformed. I preached on Romans 12, 1 and 2 so much, but when what you want and your will is contrary to God's will, only at that moment do you have a sacrifice that's beyond the sacrifice of praise. And you can only give a sacrifice of praise like when you're like Paul and Silas in prison. Okay? When you're in a hard spot and you choose to praise God, that's, that's a sacrifice of praise. But in our priesthood, when my want to does not line up with this, then I am called to be a living sacrifice, and it is my duty as a priest to bind that thing up, drag it to the altar, cut its throat, set it on fire, and force it to remain there until it's nothing but ash, which is representative of it no longer has any influence on you. And what's interesting is the lye soap that they would use like to cleanse the temple and stuff, was made from the ash of the red heifer. And I mean, it is so strong, it'll take the skin right off your bones. Sometimes your greatest cleansing is after your pet, pet, pet sin is crucified and burned up by the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Out of those ashes can come some of your greatest cleansings. But yet, in today's church, the altar, the brazen altar, has grown cold and is covered with cobwebs and dust because it's no longer used anymore because we've not been taught our priesthood. It's also a vital part of spiritual warfare, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. And this is spiritual warfare 101. You're never going to properly engage in spiritual warfare on the outside until you have won the spiritual warfare on the inside. Just the same way as Israel, until it drove out the yites, could it ever deal with the nations around them properly. You can't, you can't have a war on two fronts. Okay? Now, the Apostle Paul, this, this is spiritual warfare 101. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. I love the way the NASB translates this. He's not talking about just pulling down. He's talking about absolute destruction. You destroy that stronghold. Okay? We are destroying speculations and every high thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Taking every thought into captivity. This, this idea of spiritual warfare on the inside. Can I, can I tell you the truth? Prior to us hearing the truth of the gospel, we were fed nothing but a pack of lies on every front. Many times those lies may have even been replicated by our parents, our loved ones around us. My stepfather was very prejudiced. Really kind of ticked me off. It's like, you don't even know that black person. Why are you saying anything? It can be the other way. There's black people very prejudiced against white people. And they, they, they see the whiteness before they see the character. That's one of the dreams of Martin Luther King was to not be judged by the color of your skin, but the character of your heart. It takes time to know someone. It could be that we were abused when we were young, and then the devil told you it's your fault. There are a myriad of things that we have been taught, especially when you're younger. Did you know that 95% of everything you're ever going to learn in life, you learn by the age six? You basically came into this world with no software except to breathe, eat, fill that diaper, and learn to let them know when you wanted to start the whole process all over again, okay? Everything else from there is learned. How many vain philosophies? You see, these doctrines of demons, there are demons in the earth, and they will, they will construct attitudes around you, and they will do events in your life because they're trying to tutor you toward darkness. And so my job as a believer... My weapons are not carnal, but they're powerful through God. That, that means the ability to do anything. I'm here to give you permission today that you have a right. Exousia, the word authority. Look it, look it up in a good lexicon. The number one definition is the power of choice. The first authority that Jesus gives you is you can choose the kingdom over, of God over the kingdom of darkness. It also gives you the right to question everything. All your philosophies, all your basic programming on the inside that you live your life by, sometimes not even thinking. It's almost done at a subconscious level. But the Holy Spirit's at work. He'll do something the way you always did it, and the Holy Spirit will go, hmm, pulling back my peace, man. That's where we're supposed to be sensitive say, what? what I do? It's your stinking attitude. Well, that's the way I've always done things. That's part of the problem. Questioning, because the devil loves it. If you had something bad happen to you, it's your fault. It's your fault. No, it's not. Somebody else had a devil. And that devil infected you with his lies. And so as I go to this word, I think we almost need to be back like what, we, what the early church was for the Gentile. They came into the church with the realization that everything they had in their life was a lie up to that point. Because everything was based on the gods, small g of this earth. And so they did business this way because that's what the gods said to do. We did it this way. This, this is the way family is. And, and their idea of sexuality and all these things came out of the mystery religions and a pagan culture. Can you imagine having to relearn everything? The only advantage they had is they knew it. They knew it. And we don't. But we 
have got to learn, I have the right to pull every thought captive. Stop, examine it, align it with the word, and to say, I repent of that. I plead the blood of Jesus into the origin of that. I command it, you get out of my life. I reject you. You're no longer truth. And guys, say it out loud. It's okay to talk to yourself when you're in your, in your prayer closet. Okay? Now, if you do it in public, go ahead and put one of those layer pieces on like people think you're talking on the phone or something so they don't call the guys with the straight jackets. But the interesting thing about the way God created you is your hard drive, you, you, you remember in minute detail everything that ever happened to you. You can't always access it, but it's there. It's called the unconscious mind. But it's constantly looking to update its software. And so when you read the word out loud, when you hear the word, when you speak truth, and you declare, that's not true, this is true. How many times you say it until you start believing it? Each time you're overriding that hard drive, you're, you're erasing that lie. You're pulling stones out of the walls of that stronghold. And then after you get that level, then you begin building an altar for God. That's working out your salvation with fear and trembling. And in that process, God, the whole time, and guys, God will not have you face your Goliath starting off with. In the life of David, the first thing he had to deal with are coyotes and wolves. Okay? That's the job of a shepherd when you go back and you, you, you research the ancient shepherds. He got confident enough in his warfare, he took down a bear and a lion. He took down coyotes, maybe a pack of them. He, he could drive them off, took down a bear, took down a lion before he ever got to Goliath. Because God will not put more on you than you're able to bear. And so you'll start with the rabbits before you, you know, the things that you easily run with. He'll let you go after the rabbits before you have to fight your Goliath because he will, the grace of God in your maturity. Once you're strong enough, he, and so the more that you mature, the more that you're changing, even more so than when you first got saved. Because the Holy Spirit's diving deeper. And that's one of the things I've been really just crying out to God here lately. Get deep. Go deep. I, I don't want a shovel. I want you to show up with one of those extended backhoes. Okay? I want to dig deep because it's easy for all of us to let the world creep in. Or just get so aggravated at the mundane of life that we just kind of tune stuff out and we're not working like we should. And we let some of the ice creep back in the borders. And so we're in a season. We say, well, Mike, I need to know, and I'm going to end with this. I need to know, you know, what's going to happen? When's Trump going to get back in? What are they going to do? Are we headed towards socialism if we let it? You're going to have to raise up and fight, okay, with truth. I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. Quit being an information junkie because you know what? I could tell you precisely everything that's going to happen in minute detail, but if you're not doing this, you're going to end up being a part of the problem, not the solution. In fact, the reason we got in this place is because we ain't been doing this as a whole. Because we are the salt and the light in the earth. Not Washington, D.C., not the secular government, not the university that's stuck on socialistic stupidity. I mean, nobody's safe. They, they, they've gone after Mr. Potato Head. I don't think that ought to be one of the apocalyptic signs. They went after Mr. Potato Head. End of the world. Game over. When that stuff is happening, we're not being salty enough. We enter into this and begin developing kingdom muscle. We start being salty again. We start being light in the earth. And the interesting thing about light is it shows up what's really there when light comes on the scene. Things can hide in dust, can hide in the darkness. But they scatter like cockroaches. I always wonder what Washington would look like if there was ever something released of God that for two days nobody could speak anything but absolute truth, they would turn off the news networks. 
Nobody could say a thing. Get up there. I'm a crook. This is how I got rich. Backhanded dealing. We cheated. Come on. I don't care about the American people. I just tell you what you want to hear. But I get my money from this corporation. Ha 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 ha. And you think I represent you. But I tell you their agenda is saying I'm here to protect you. The very first words, at least in America, the very first words, we the people, they forgot that. They're supposed to work for us. But why is all that putridness going on? It's because we the people don't have enough salt and light to affect that. And that's going to change in the name of Jesus. And Father, right now I pray everyone who listens to this, Father, I cry out for revival. Father, I believe that the fear of the Lord is returning to your church once again. And Father, that we are going to pick up the weapons of our warfare. We are going to do the work for maturity. You're going to cause us to will and do your good pleasure. And the light is going to come on in your people so that darkness has to run and hide. And Father, we believe it come to pass. Father, we need revival. There is a harvest unprecedented in human history that needs to come into the kingdom. And Father, we ask that you would do the work in us so that we could be a small part of that revival. And Father, let us set anyone on fire for Jesus that we come across. And we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the Kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principalities' wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The Kingdom Priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, 
P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.